Hello and welcome to this episode of Pop Culture Quorum Deo. We appreciate you downloading and taking the time to listen to this episode. My name is Jeff and I'm here with my friend Jared and we are your hosts. Since this is one of our early episodes, we want to be clear about what we're doing here and why we're doing it and who we are. And we thought the best way to accomplish that would be to go through those specific questions. And so, Jared, I'm going to ask you and then I'll answer from uh, my part the same three quick questions about what it is that motivated us to create the Pop Culture Quorum Deo podcast. So number one, why are we doing this podcast, Jared? Basically discipleship. You know, Christians are pretty much watching these movies that we're interacting with for the most part. Um, So discipleship is part of it um, to train Christians how to interact with popular culture and also how the gospel answers the various idols that our culture presents. You know, pop pop culture presents basically the the dominating ideas that are going on and ideologies um, in our culture. And so it's kind of a, a pulse of our society and the pulse of our congregations and the pulse of, of our communities. Um, it's presented in popular culture. And not only that, but it, it shows you the next few years down the road, you know, what's coming down the pipe as well. And so by being able to interact with that, it trains Christians how to interact with their neighbors, how to interact with politics, how to interact with basically every avenue of life that they interact with on a daily basis. Um, it shows them how to apply the gospel to that. And the second reason is so not only, not only discipleship, but also to engage unbelievers with the gospel to show how, you know, pop culture many in many ways re- recognizes a lot of the same evil that the Bible does, that, there, that there's something wrong with the world. Now, they often misdiagnose what is wrong with the world, and so they thus get the remedy wrong as well. When Christians um, recognize where, the, where what is wrong is displayed incorrectly, they can correct it by showing that it's really sin is the issue, and we need a Savior. We need a Redeemer. And so um, we can engage folks with the gospel through this podcast and train our hearers as well how to engage their neighbors. Uh, I'm very interested in engaging with story as a part of discipleship. I think history is a story that God is telling about his son Jesus and image bearers, fallen though they may be, like you and I and the people who are creating uh, what we call pop culture, the songs and the shows and the movies and whatnot, they can't help but tell stories within the context of that broader story. Sometimes those stories are false. Sometimes those stories are true. Most often they're a mixed bag. And so as thinking Christians, that's what we're called to do. We're to, to uh, love the Lord our God with our minds. We're we're interested in helping people say, here's where I see the truth of the living God. Here's where I see the beauty of the gospel. Here's where I see the goodness of the kingdom uh, poking through or shining through. And here are lies that I see that need to be rejected. And so it's good for Christians to learn how to consume pop culture in a way that helps them love the good and hate the evil. Uh, I do like you said, want to want to create bridges into the world of my lost neighbor who I'm called to love with the gospel and meeting him in the stories that he loves is a common ground that can be useful to explain the gospel to him. Of course, it, it's not going to be saving. It is the power of God uh, present in the preaching of the gospel that saves. But nonetheless, we have models in the Bible of Paul quoting poets and other aspects of the culture that was known in the day as, as a means by which he would he would try to help his audience see the gospel as understandable. And so we want to do that through, you know, these stories that we consume and that we talk about across lots of different relationships. And then lastly, the the thing I'm going to add, Jared, is I also want to, I want to encourage believers who are going to be listening to stories, who are going to be engaging with pop culture on some level because it's the air we breathe. I want them to find the joy of seeing the goodness of the Lord reflected in the stories told by the people who bear his image. I want them to see the glory of God afresh in uh, the the things that come out uh, of Hollywood and, and other places around our country that often are thought of as just moral wastelands, but kind of put under a microscope, you start to see that the, the power of the image of God in which these people were created is so irrepressible that it it, it beams out constantly, even in, in places we wouldn't expect. So that's why I'm interested in doing it, and I fully affirm what you said there uh, in your answer as well. That begs the question, though, I think to follow up. Should Christians watch secular movies? You and I have identified the first several movies we're going to look at. Uh, they're they're not facing the giants or God is not dead. These come from people who aren't trying to give a winsome witness for Jesus Christ. So why should Christians or should Christians watch secular movies? Well, we, I wouldn't say that they necessarily should. I, I'm saying that they that they can um, if their conscience allows them. You know, we, we don't want anyone who's listening to this to violate their conscience. You have to know your own heart. Um, 
um, and and what your various uh, temptations are. Um, we are saying that that I mean Jeff and I obviously believe that we are free in Christ to watch these movies, and we want to watch them in such a way that we recognize that we glorify the Lord, that we recognize, as Jeff said, God's uh, image that is present in man and God's fingerprints that are displayed by His image bearers. And and you know our our goal in in uh, interacting with popular culture is to basically take those fingerprints where sinful man has has basically tried to disconnect those fingerprints from God um, by not acknowledging Him. We're saying, no, 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 these fingerprints are God's fingerprints, and we're trying to connect them back to God in light of the finished work of Christ, in light of the redeeming work of Christ, and what God has communicated through His inerrant Word about history, about mankind, about what is wrong with the world, and who's going to fix it. And so, um, you know, that that's part of um, the reason as well why, why we're doing um, while we're doing this podcast. You got anything to add to that, buddy? Well, I'm, I'm with you on saying, we're not saying should, but we are saying possibly at least can. Uh, and I just want to elaborate on that for a second. There is much in the Bible about what you choose to put in front of your eyes. And specifically, there's a lot of prohibitions about putting worthless things in front of your eyes. But the Bible assumes that a Christian conscience directed by the Holy Spirit and, you know, sort of formed positively and helped by a local body of believers will fill in what it means to identify something as worthless or holding worth. And so what we're saying is there's there's an open door in Scripture to say, that since there's no thou shalt not watch Netflix, that it's at least open for consideration that Christians can watch at least some things on Netflix. And we're trying to thread that line faithfully. We want to be people who know the, the world that we're called to engage with the gospel, but we also don't want to be people who just just swim in the filth of toxic pop culture. And so I just want to say we're open to feedback. We're open to pushback. I'm, I'm happy to hear your counsel. The other thing I want to say is to the person listening to this who says, you know, I heard Jared tell me to obey my conscience. Yeah, you really need to do that. So we want to stress that if your conscience is telling you don't watch this film, don't watch this film. But the other caution I want to add is don't decide what your conscience is telling you in a vacuum. You Your conscience is going to be much more more open to turning on Game of Thrones sitting alone in your apartment at 10.30 p.m. than it would be when you have invited your godly grandmother and two of the elders from your church over for dinner. And so you want to be deciding what your conscience is telling you in concert with the testimony and the encouragement and the admonition of a local church body. So don't don't treat this as a solo project. Solo Christianity is not present in the Bible in terms of being disconnected from a church and local body and you don't want to approach consuming media produced by secular minds as if you're the only voice who needs to speak into this. If it, you know, it's just me and God and my conscience, and we'll figure it out. Get godly people in your life. Get older people, people from different age ranges, different uh, backgrounds. Get them engaged in this conversation you're having with yourself about what you can find acceptable to watch. Good word. Good word. Uh, lastly, just to introduce ourselves, who are we, Jared? And why don't you take that question first? Who are you? Um, um Jared. I've been a Christian since I was. Uh... My name's Jared Moore. I've been a Christian since I was about 17 years of age. I was raised in church my whole life, saved at 17, and uh, God changed my life and uh, committed to the ministry at an early age, a year or two after I was made that profession of faith, and um, been in ministry now for, I think this is 18th year of uh, ministry in a Southern Baptist context, and I'm currently the pastor of Homestead Baptist in Crossville, Tennessee, and I'm a, a PhD candidate at Southern Baptist Theology. Theological Seminary and a greater there. And uh, I just want to bring honor and glory to the Lord. You know, the, our greatest goal here is to, you know, we, we want to benefit the church. We want to help, we want to train Christians to think biblically about their culture. And we believe that if you approach pop culture the way that we hopefully are training you through this podcast, that you'll not only approach pop culture in a godly way, you'll approach all of life um, with a Christian worldview. Well, I am Jeff Wright, and I have known Jared since. Since our days in elementary school, we became friends in middle school. I'm the product of a household that had good things to say about Jesus. I had a believing mother who took me to church my whole life, and I experienced a conversion somewhere between my childhood years and my early teenage days. Um, I'm someone who's always wrestled with assurance and, and knowing because I was taught to believe that my assurance was rooted in how sincere I was when I prayed the sinner's prayer, and I always found in my heart, anyway, that there was room to suspect there was insincerity at some level. 
And uh, thankfully, I have learned to see that my salvation is found in looking to Jesus Christ and His finished work. But that leaves me in a place where I can't say this date I was saved. But uh, thankfully, there has been uh, evidence of the work of the Spirit in my life. The local church that I grew up in, as well as the churches I've served vocationally, have seen evidence of grace there as well and have been a comfort to me in affirming that uh, I am one of Christ's people, even as His Spirit testifies that within me as well. Uh, I serve vocationally as the pastor of Midway Baptist Church in Cookville, Tennessee. I am super blessed to have that position. This is a better church than I deserve, and they are better to me uh, as a congregation than I deserve. Married to Christy, who is involved in classical Christian education. I'm assuming at some point in this show you will hear from her because I often go to her with the kind of conversations that Jared and I will be having. And then we have four kids, and my desire is, much like Jared said, to, to edify the church as much as it's possible and to redeem the time that, that many of us are spending engaging, consuming, discussing pop culture. You know, Jared said, we want to train you to um, see everything through a Christian worldview. I'm going to be happy if we model that well and that you begin to see a profitable way in your own thinking and watching and reading and listening to uh, to see the glory of Christ because that's ultimately what we're all after. We want to see the glory of Christ made more fully known. That's our hope here. So in His grace, uh, hopefully we'll see that happen to some degree. Anything else there, Jared? I also am married and have four kids. Yeah, man, you better get that wife mentioned in there. You're going to get in trouble. I don't know. I'm going to get in trouble. <laughs> One more question. What's the deal with the name of your show? Well, that's a great question. When we say pop culture, we're using a phrase that has a nearly unlimited set of differing definitions. For the purpose of this podcast, we're defining pop culture as the exchange of ideas through mass media. So we want to talk about what the creators of popular books, music, shows, and particularly movies are asking us to think about when they release content. And what about Coram Deo? Coram Deo speaks to the essential element of what Jared and I want to do. The phrase means in the presence of God. Here's the late R.C. Sproul on the phrase's larger meaning. To live quorum Deo is to live one's entire life in the presence of God, under the authority of God, to the glory of God. To live in the presence of God is to understand that whatever we are doing and wherever we are doing it, we are acting under the gaze of God. God is omnipresent. There's no place so remote that we can escape His penetrating gaze. To be aware of the presence of God is to also be acutely aware of His sovereignty. The uniform experience of the saints is to recognize that if God is God, then He indeed is is sovereign. Living under divine sovereignty involves more, though, than a reluctant submission to sheer sovereignty that is motivated out of a fear of punishment. It involves recognizing that there is no higher goal than offering honor to God. Our lives are to be living sacrifices, oblations offered in a spirit of adoration and gratitude. So when someone creates an artifact of pop culture, some song or book or film, that creator does so in the presence of the creator. And every time you and I engage with that piece of culture, we're doing so in the presence of God. As believers, we want to do that well. And this podcast is an effort to help others do it well too. Just as a heads up, you'll be hearing this exact intro in each of our first five episodes so that we're clear about who we are and what we're hoping to accomplish. If you listen to more than one of those first five episodes, and we really hope you will, you can either listen to this introduction again or skip forward to the 13 or 14 minute mark with your podcast player and start listening to the discussion of the film for that episode. So, Jared, we're about to review a movie that is, it's a horror movie, and it is hard horror. I mean, this is not kid stuff that we're we're talking about here today with this film. And so I thought we would do just a supplemental explanation of what our thinking is on why we chose a movie like this to review, what we think it has to offer a Christian, or, or how a Christian should uh, consider if it has anything to offer. And um, just want to run through a couple points on that. So when you're thinking about watching a horror movie as as a Christian, let's just start. Can, can you justify watching horror as a Christian? I, be, I believe you can. Uh, in many in many ways, you know, pop culture is sometimes sometimes muddied as far as the difference between good and evil. But in horror, in that genre, that's that's one a redeemable quality about the genre of horror is that that usually there is a clear good and a clear evil, and in many cases, good wins out. Absolutely. So we live in a day that is very unwilling to identify evil as an objective reality. We, un unless of course we're talking about whatever the latest political trend is, right? So being uh, abusive to the environment, we'll say that's evil or, uh, you know, 
forcing someone to act uh, against whatever they understand their most authentic identity to be. We say that's evil. But when it comes down to saying this act, this crime even, was an act of evil, we're we're very reluctant just as a people to say, yeah, that is objectively evil. We look for psychological explanations. We look for um, sociological justifications to say this person is actually sick. They're not evil. That's very much true. Sometimes people are sick and are acting from that in a way that harms others. But we also want to say, as Christians, there is such a thing as evil. There is, in reality, things that set themselves up against the glory of God and the progress of His kingdom and the good of His image bearers that He has ordained in His grace. And so horror reminds us, no, for real, evil exists. And thankfully, as you mentioned, it should be opposed. And in fact, we should be opposing it. Horror kind of pushes that button for us. Oftentimes as well, I've got this quote actually from Brian Gaw- Ottawa, and he talks about some of the benefits of horror in an interview that Tony Rinke did on Desiring God. You can find it. The article is titled, Do You Get It? And so you can just do a search for it there and find it. Um, but he, Godawa says, horror is often based on irony and the unveiling of evil that appears to be good. Like real life, in real life, evil monsters, as in abusers, rapists, and killers, use the disguise of good in order to capture and hurt the innocent. So using common images of safety to caution the innocent against naive trust is an excellent moral lesson. And so that's that's uh, one thing that horror does present is that um, oftentimes it is the, you know, it's the enemy that's hiding in plain sight, right? And, and, and forcing you as you watch that horror movie and you're on edge because you don't know who the, who the killer is or who the person is, but it's often someone who's in close proximity to the, um, to the person, um, to the person who's innocent, to the person who's fearful. And so it does, kind of help you now you you know, you know it can it can encourage you to be paranoid if you're not if you're not careful which would obviously be negative but you know we shouldn't just be naive because we live in in indeed an evil world i mean it's it's interesting you know folks who don't believe in evil still lock their doors at night right <laughs> there's a reason why we do mm, for sure it, it it's a it's an internal contradiction in our culture and thankfully horror kind of sp- shines a spotlight on that it, it's a useful spotlight in that sense um the other thing i'm going to mention is that there is an avenue for loving my neighbor and loving my brother in watching horror. Again, with the caveat that your conscience, informed by the Word of God, controlled by the Spirit of God, and in conversation with the people of God in a specific local church, allows you to watch any particular horror movie. Just in general, horror raises fear, right? That's the nature of the genre. So it, it pulls fears out of my heart and asks me to consider them. Uh, you know, am, am I going to be safe? What determines what whether or not I'm going to be safe. What happens when evil strikes out of the clear blue sky the way it so often does in uh, in the real world? But also with my neighbor, um, he's going to be wrestling with fears. And my brother in the church, he's going to have fears in his heart too. So horror gives us common ground to meet and talk about those things if we're intentional about doing so. I'm uh, thinking about people that you'll run into uh, at your office or your neighborhood get together, wherever you do your grocery shopping, um, who, who don't know Jesus. Jesus, don't love him. Well, there's certain things that give you an ample opportunity to talk about his goodness. And sometimes it's fear, right? It, it's fears within them that his, excuse me, his kingdom and his righteous reign will address within them. I'm, I'm thinking about in our day, uh, horror movies ask a largely secular culture to say, are you really sure that nothing exists outside of the natural order? Because if the supernatural does exist, there could be some dangers to you there. I mean, it seems like... 60% of new horror movies are built around the idea of demons and exorcism. I think part of that is a national, uh, I shouldn't say national, is a sort of cultural wrestling with the idea if we might not have thrown away some things we should have kept when we threw away the idea that there's something out there beyond the natural world. And for Christians, that's totally profitable because we can say, well, if, if you're open to the idea of demons, they belong to some sort of order. And if they're around, could there not be uh, a creator? God, uh, who is also in the supernatural realm. Now, not only he certainly intervenes and acts within the natural realm, but it raises the possibility. Or you think about an age that has turned to science as its savior and technological advancement to do away with death and uh, poverty and human suffering. Well, horror movies do a good job of saying, can science do anything that will betray me? (laughs) Will the robots rise up and take over society? Will there be a virus unleashed we didn't see coming and it will change 
change who we are as human creatures? What does it mean to be a human creature anyway if a virus can come and do that? Those are all questions that are really useful to a Christian in serving his neighbor uh, in terms of building a bridge into a conversation about the gospel. So I, th- I think in the way that it asks us to deal with our fears, horror is helpful there as well. Mm, that's a good point, buddy. I've, I've got uh, one more quote here from Godawa that I'd like to read. This comes from the same article. He says, The moral purpose of the horror genre is to expose what evil is, reinforce our need for courage to fight evil, and to have a healthy, righteous fear instead of naive innocence when it comes to discernment in the world. Sounds like the Bible. God uses the horror genre to solicit righteous fear of evil and encourage repentance and righteous living. Beyond um, these examples, the book, the books of Daniel and Revelation are epic horror fantasies of blood and gore using symbolic horror monsters as an analogy for real life. That's what all horror does. It works as a metaphor for something else, like social commentary, underworld, spiritual truth, Jekyll and Hyde, or man's hubris, Frankenstein. God uses zombies and vampires as metaphors for spiritual evil in Scripture, like Micah 3, 1 through 3, Ezekiel 39, 18 and 19. God uses Frankenstein monsters as metaphors for political and social commentary, Ezekiel eleven nineteen, Revelation 13, 1 through 2. One of God's favorite horror metaphors is cannibalism as a literary symbol, a spiritual apostasy. In Ezekiel 36, 13 through 14, Psalm 27, 2, Proverbs 30, verse 14, Jeremiah 19, 9, Zechariah 11, 9. This does not justify all horror stories ever told, far from it. It simply establishes the genre in broad terms as one that God uses. Therefore, it can be used with moral purpose, end quote. I, I thought that was a great uh, quote and great point to consider how God uses horror. I mean, have you 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 ever read listener? Have you ever read the Book of Revelation? You ever read how awful the depictions are of what it's going to be like when Christ? I mean, when Christ comes to rule and reign and wipes out all his enemies? Or hey, also it, the Book of Judges, just in recounting the history of the people of God. Oh yeah, I mean it, it's it's all over the place in Scripture. I mean it's terrifying. It's to send us running, running not away from God. The fear is to send us running to God because who else can save us from God but God? You're here. Um, last thing I'm going to add in on this is just a, a word of honesty. People are watching horror movies in, in incredible numbers if uh, if the ticket sales are any indication. And that means Christians are watching horror movies. We're, we're recording this in the early days of 2018. 2017 was yet another year where you heard stories that Hollywood is out of ideas. They're making movies based on the, the board game Battleship. They just don't know what to do anymore. And the movies that came out of 2017 that people resonated with and were willing to spend money on were Split and Get Out and It. That tells me it's not just secular people running to watch those films and resonating enough with them to give up hard-earned money for it. If Christians are watching this, let's be honest about it, let's be upfront about it, and let's subject it openly to the scrutiny of the, the Word of God and see what see what that scrutiny produces. So let's let's just put our cards on the table. Anything else, brother? That's it, buddy. Okay, well, let's go ahead and get started on this episode's movie. All right, guys, I am here with Jared Moore. So you and I both, we're Christians. We have roles of leadership in the church. People's consciences just respond to different media and messages and content within that media and messages in different ways. And so just put it up front for any fellow believer who's listening. uh, What are some conscience issues that this movie raises that that people may want to be aware of when they're considering watching this film? This this movie has quite a bit of language in it. Lord's name in vain, um, you know, as far as bad words, you know, quote unquote bad words that may um, offend folks consciences. Um, but also, um, you know, there, there's also, uh, the main idol is self-interest, self, self-love, selfishness. And so if that is something particular that you have struggled with, um, big time. And so you, you know, you, you need to know your own heart and you need to know what you're allowed, um, based on your own conscience, um, to participate in, to watch. Um, and so we just want to kind of put those red flags up there for folks whose consciences. So if you're tempted to go down, you know, if you're, you know, let's say you used to cuss like crazy and you struggle with, with cussing, um, you know, you may not want to watch this movie. If you um, struggle with uh, self-interest, you're overly selfish and believe that this movie will negatively impact you. 
um, then you shouldn't watch it. You know, we do, we don't want you to unnes- to violate your conscience intentionally, and so you just need to be aware of that, aware of your own heart. Yeah, I, I don't want to contradict anything Jared just said, but I'm gonna I'm gonna I'm gonna push in just a little bit in this way. If you are someone who struggles with with selfishness, if if you can get with a community and watch this film and talk through it, particularly with people in your church, I think this movie may serve your conscience by showing you the end of what continuing to walk in selfishness will bring you to. Uh, this is a pretty good parable about the the way that selfishness leads straight into the grave. And so it may be something that if you've got brothers and sisters around you who enjoy watching movies whose consciences aren't offended, it may be helpful to you to see an alternative universe that looks like what's going on in your heart. Because where this story ends is where your story will end too if you, like me, uh, struggle with selfishness and then give in to it regularly. You're going to see the end of that course in John Carpenter's The Thing. Jared, can you tell me where you were in life the first time you saw this movie and why you think it is rooted in your head, you know, for all these years? Where were you when you first saw this movie? Why do you think you love it so much? Um, I think I was by myself, man, um, just when I was uh, in college. And um, I just, I've always enjoyed horror movies um, or horror books even. Uh, when I was a kid in elementary school, I would rent, uh, check out from the library, stuff like The Mummy and Dracula and, and things like that. And um, whenever I could, I would watch horror movies. My one of my favorite movies growing up, and I don't know that you necessarily call it horror, but for a for a kid, it is would be the Predator um, with Arnold Schwarzenegger. And um, and I used to go to sleep watching that movie. I would I had an old uh, VHS tape that was uh, that was really awful. I think it was recorded. Um, I mean, there, there were wavy lines in it and everything. But I would put that movie on when I was going to sleep. Um, and so I've just enjoyed horror for so many years, and uh, and now uh, as a uh, as a believer, um, as a Christian, it um, it's helpful because as far as popular culture is concerned, um, horror there's there's usually a clear good and a clear evil. And in most cases, good wins out, um, which is something often rare in popular culture, it seems. Yeah, there's a lot there that I'd kind of like to pick your brain on. But first, you went to bed watching a movie that you considered scary. How did you ever get any sleep? I, I don't know, man. I love that movie, though. Um, I, one of my best friends, Bill Jones, his daddy, and uh, um, his brothers watched it, and I saw it with them for the first time, and they they gave me a tape of it. Um, I don't know, man. That's still one of the classics um, as far as um, I mean, as far as suspense and and not knowing what's around the corner, and just the thought of someone something invisible. And it's kind of like this movie. There's some, an invisible monster that's kind of hidden in plain sight that you can't you can't really uh, escape. And um, you know, there's a there's a thrill as well as uh, the jumpy, scary stuff. Things jumping out and and shaking you up. Um, kind of gets the blood flowing a little bit as far yeah. as pragmatically. You know, I, I enjoy that as well. And these this movie in particular. You know, you watch old horror fi- flicks and a lot of the a lot of the special effects are weak and and um you know or compared to today you know you can just tell it's fake like i I remember watching an old Freddy Krueger film, and uh, there's one scene where um, I think at the end of the movie, Freddy reaches out and grabs a, a woman and pulls her through a hole. Oh, yeah, yeah. Um, pulls her down into her bed, right? I mean, that's kind of famous. Well, there in one of the scenes, it, it's you can tell it's a blow-up figure. Like, it's it's a it's almost like a float that you play with in the pool or something that they yeah. that he jerks <laughs> through the, you know, and um, I just remember that. Um, but anyways, yeah, I, I've I've enjoyed uh, I've enjoyed this movie for a long time. First time I saw it, it just it stuck with me as far as how real it appeared. I guess and uh, it was always. I mean the the scene where the, the arms are being ripped off. I mean the first time I saw that, that just burned in my memory because um, I I was not expecting it. Because you you know at the beginning of the movie, you when you see a monster for the first time, you assume that uh, the way that it kills folks is going to be basically the same. You know, or, or you're you kind of know what to look for once it happens once. Um, but good grief, later on, um, you know those scenes just burn in your memory. 
Well, so I've got a confession for you. I think in in the past when I have told you about this movie, when you said, hey, we need to watch this, and I said, you know, I, I, I don't know when we'll cover it. We will at some point because I think John Carpenter just gets by default. Uh, you know, you assume you're going to work through his catalog if you're doing a horror podcast. But I had I'd sort of been talking through that with you as someone who didn't understand and appreciate your appreciation for this film. But here's the deal, man. I totally have never seen this movie before. I, just getting ready for this podcast, I really realized I know the beats of this movie or at least the broad strokes of it but it's because it's in the pop culture you know ecosystem in which I live I don't think until getting ready for this podcast I've ever watched all the way through it and I can tell you I mean spoiler alert for this podcast I could really get I think now a lot of what you found so captivating about this movie I'm not surprised by that I generally like John Carpenter's work Halloween's my favorite slasher I love his movie called Christine that's an adaptation of a Stephen King novel Uh, Mm -hmm. but this this film is really riveting. I spent, I would say, 80% of this film with my jaw just unhinged for for several different reasons. Um, But before we get into that in more detail, I'll tell you, here's why I think I thought I had seen this movie before. It's because I'm an X-Files fan, and the eighth episode in the X-Files is Scully and Mulder in this Antarctica research center uh, tracking down this life form that, you know, infests people, but you can't see it from the outside, and it changes their personality, and so on and so forth. Forth. And I think I knew enough about the broad strokes of the of this movie, and then I watched that show way back in the 90s, and somehow in my head, those combined together to say, oh yeah, Jeff, you've watched this movie. Um, mm-hmm. Pretty startling on my end to come through that. Um, I do want to talk about the special effects you just mentioned, but let's, you know, for anybody who's... Uh, you know, just wanting to chew on this movie kind of thoroughly. Let's set the scene, scene for them. So I just mentioned we're out in some frozen wasteland, and there's a group of men uh, basically in a bunker, and it looks like maybe the most boring setting on the face of the earth, right? I mean, is that your read on how we're first dropped into the movie, or, or what stands out to you about those early moments? Oh, yeah. They're basically isolation, bored, cabin fever. Um, there's too much alcohol there, too. I mean, it, it, there's not... <laughs> I mean, these guys are, they're researchers stuck together in, there's no escape, basically, from the, the setting that they're in, um, and uh, there's there's just a ton of a ton of uh, isolation and boredom, and you kind of see that at the beginning um, when uh, Kurt Russell's character pours um, pours alcohol in the computer uh, when he loses the chess game. But uh, you know they're they're uh, they're on edge before the dog even comes running up. Yeah, so that's where that's where I think I was immediately hooked in the film that you go from this super. Uh, it almost feels like they're stuck in time. They're 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 frozen, carrying out the rhythms of whatever their research assignment is and then all of a sudden this dog and this helicopter introduced but let me ask you a question here real quick one thing i didn't understand watching this movie you know we do get introduced to mccready kurt russell's character there at the very beginning and he's up in some kind of like tower playing chess on a on an early computer drinking why does he have a little tower that's like his place to be i know he's the pilot for the group but it just seems weird to me that he's out in this other area and the only thing i can figure out is they needed another they needed another basic you know uh they basically needed a another location to film some shots did you do you have an in plot reason for him being out there i don't know if it would be for storms um kind of back in that time period um i don't know if they would have to if they would be if if storms come up so quickly there that they can see them before they can um i don't know yeah i thought it might be some kind of lookout post too but he didn't seem to be using it for looking out right because they're overcome by this helicopter by surprise and whatnot um yeah so yeah so we we just get into this deal where the guy there's a guy flying a helicopter and he's taking shots at what i first thought was a wolf but pretty quickly you realize one he can't shoot and then number two uh, as they approach camp, this is the camp dog. It's a you know Alaskan breed of dog or whatever. It's domesticated. It lives there. And this guy lands and he starts shooting at the dog and he starts moving into the compound, shooting at people there. And I think that's where my jaw first came unhinged because you have this strong contrast between um, you know the the frozen boredom that we talked about earlier and this guy dropping in. And you start to get a sense of invasion, right? Mm-hmm. Um, the, let me ask you this: this this may be too like navel 
stargazing. I don't know. But do you think that that opening scene of that, what we now know is an infested dude irrationally hunting this dog, is is sort of a, an opening metaphor for the movie? That there's this invader coming from outside of this community that's going to attempt to hunt, you know, each of the people that we've just been introduced to down? I wondered, I, I'm asking because I kind of wondered if Carpenter wasn't giving us a, you know, a, a preview, a foreshadowing of what we were going to be getting into in the rest of the film. Possibly, possibly, because you have a, I mean, you have a human being coming and um, basically seeking his own survival to the point, I mean, he's willing to take out that uh, animal in any way he can, um, but, um, yeah, anyway. yeah. It it, it it may be thinking too hard about the subject. I just wanted to raise the issue. But um, anything that you think about the way that Carpenter builds this world, you want to comment on? You know, we my assumption is that we're supposed to see this as basically the world we live in, except this is a world the aliens have visited in the past. Anything you're seeing there that goes beyond that? Um, I, I saw where uh, in researching for this uh, podcast that it, uh, Carpenter remade a film that was called The Thing from Another World. Um, but instead of basing this movie on that, he actually went back to the novel that that original movie was based on which is uh the title of it was who goes there and it's by john campbell um you know so he he goes back to that and he emphasizes um emphasizes this this uh, almost like a invasion of the body snatchers you know this uh, the monster hiding in plain sight um but i think he's highlighting um, I, th- I think he the metaphor that you were talking about at the beginning. I think that's kind of prevalent throughout. That um, basically mankind, um, we need each other, and that that's kind of what the emphasis of the movie is. And and it, it's almost like it's almost nihilistic, you know, the the argument of the movie that there there's there's nothing um, that basically man at the end of the day m- mankind are just monsters themselves. If when you stick them in a room with when one of them may be the killer. Um, everybody starts getting selfish, um, and it, se- it to me it seems like he's arguing that throughout this movie that at the end of the day that we man only cares about himself. So it, it's reducing this down to the survival instinct. There's nothing really essential to humanity other than the, the desire to preserve ourselves. That's what it seems, and which mean which that's the same as the creature. I mean that's the that's the monster. That's what the monster is. That's why he's killing everybody. Right, um, right. That's a good point. And so we are uh, we're basically the same as the alien um and i I think that's i think in that in the movie just from beginning to end you see that i mean even the the so-called hero um murders someone in the movie you know um i mean the guy was coming at him to punch him but he shoots him in the head or to to stab him but yeah right he straight up executed him and one of those characters i think it's childs kind of points out like oh hey guess what now you're a murderer bud yeah yeah exactly right and um and he doesn't care i mean you know he doesn't he doesn't care one bit. I mean, it's all about his survival. Um, I actually read that there's a that there was another ending to this movie where um, uh, the main character actually escapes, like he's rescued. And uh, Carpenter um, actually he did, he ended up not liking that ending. Um, but that would see, I like that ending. I wish that that would have, you know, at least there's something. There's something good, you know, but there's nothing really good that comes out of this movie. Okay, well, I'm, I'm gonna I'm gonna play devil's advocate a little bit here. I, I think one of the things that Carpenter does very quickly, uh, and, and it's evidence of him being a really good storyteller and film developer, is that you see this community. Uh, you know, it's a group of guys. I, I don't think anybody, unless you're really into isolation, wants to sign up to live long term in an environment like that. But those guys have a pretty um, fraternal relationship, is what it looks like. Right, that they're they're playing ping pong or pool or something inside there. Uh, one of them, you know, got shot, and so he's wanting to rest. And another guy's playing his music too loud. And there, there's just sort of what you would see in a locker room with guys like pushing back on each other and whatnot. But they they seem to generally get along. Oh yeah, they're best. I mean, many of them are are really close friends. There's a there's a there's a hierarchy of respect and command. Like it seems like everything's functioning pretty well. And I think you're right. Carpenter's probably showing us that to say, hey, look how quickly these things break down. Look how quickly basically society breaks down if people's self-interest is challenged. But nonetheless, this is the kind of place where you're like, I, these guys strike me as generally good dudes. I would enjoy playing a game of ping pong with them. Mm-hmm. So you care when everything goes sideways on them, right? Oh, absolutely. You care about each each of the characters. I mean, for the most part, um, 
you care about. I mean, you, they're, they're, like you said, it, it is a fraternal community. Well, so then here's where the pushback comes from. There are several lines of dialogue with, I think, uh, Dr. Blair, I think is the one I'm thinking of. Maybe it's Dr. Copper, but I think it's Dr. Blair, which, by the way, a pre-diabetes pitch man, Wilford Brimley. I hadn't seen a movie with him in a long time. Yeah. Um, he he basically starts destroying everything so that the the infectious agent will die out there in the snow and not be taken back to human society. And if we take, you know, to jump all the way to the ending, which we've got a lot more to talk about with the ending, but when you get to the ending, when Child comes back out of the frozen wasteland and Kurt Russell's there, you know, the impression you get is that Kurt Russell has made a decision to die there, right? So that he doesn't take this alien spawn back into human society. Are you reading mm-hmm. that differently? You think I'm wrong on that no i think you're right um i question if the you know is it brimley so well, brimley's he, character is dr blair dr he's, blair I, I question whether dr blair when he's tearing everything up if he is not hasn't been taken over by the alien at that point we, isn't he the one though who was running like computer simulations and by the way the computer graphics in this movie are like uh, straight out of a time capsule man uh, yeah the the virus taking over healthy cells is one of the fu- i mean it's even shaped like a little mean pointed triangle you know what i mean yeah but he's calculating you know basically by the time it gets to this area world population is infested by xyz and i think that's when he goes and locks himself away so you're i was reading that as this is an uninfected guy who has read the tea leaves early and and isolated himself. You're reading it as he's making plans on how to get the infection to uh, a populated area quicker, right? Possibly. Possibly, yeah. And by the time he starts tearing everything up, um, we learn that he disabled the helicopter for the purpose of actually making a spaceship. Oh, that's right. That's right. He down that like ice cave or whatever. He built some kind of spaceship. Yeah, I guess you're right there. Okay. Well, so then let me ask you about McCready. So obviously you've taken my argument apart with Dr. Blair. What about McCready to and die in the wastes. Is your thought that he was just making fire to last as long as he could? He didn't have any other resources. Um, I I think that he was. Uh, I mean, you kind of you kind of don't know by the by the time you get to the end. Um, but I think that he was still. I think he was still fully human. I think him and Bo- Child both were. Um, but they. Um, you know the the thing is that the monster can survive. It just kind of lies dormant in the ice. Um, so they were hoping that they blew it up, from what I understand. Um, but they had accepted that they would die. I think. Okay, so it's just they don't have any hope at that point. Okay. Yeah. Well, um, I guess that is bringing me up to my real question about the ending here. But before we do that, I just want to note that man, the special effects in this movie. Um, you mentioned kind of in negative comparison the stuff from Friday the Thirteenth. I'm with you. A lot of early movies. Uh, excuse me. A lot of horror movies that are early on in my life that I can remember, some of them stand out and you go, man, that was incredible. Special effects were great. You know, I, I appreciate maybe Poltergeist as an example of a movie that at the time, the special effects really got to me. Mm-hmm. Man, I've never seen better monster effects. Straight up, uh, carte blanche like uh, no qualifications I, this is the best monster movie i think i've ever seen that's a horror movie the mm. the dog creature that comes out of that first infected dog mm-hmm. and then when um later mccready has everybody tied up and he's testing their blood and yeah the creatures outed the the thing whatever you would call the thing that uh, it becomes there but really the pinnacle is when um it's charles hallahan's character vance norris um he's mm-hmm. he's having an autopsy done and then all of a sudden his stomach opens up and bites off Dr. Copper's arms. And yeah. Then that creature with his face leaps up to the ceiling. And then when it's getting fried, his head detaches and becomes a spider thing. I'm telling you, man, I could not have been more stunned by the uh, the effects in this movie. It, I mm-hmm. couldn't have been more stunned if one of those creatures had walked into my <laughs> office when I was watching it. I yeah. was blown away by the visuals in this movie. So I don't know who coordinated special effects on this film but whoever you are sir a doff of my cap to you well done it was a it was actually a young fella i think he was in his early 20s um i can't remember his name but um you know this was one of his earlier films um and there was another guy who i think did the howling who did the dog creature but it was two two guys and i think maybe roby maybe roby's the second fella's name but um he did he did the most part as far as like the the sculptures like you know when they bring the thing back from the 
the Norwegian camp, uh-huh. um, and uh, that was a that was a sculpture. And I know they sprayed it with some sort of nasty like substance from uh, Twinkies, like the stuff that holds Twinkies together. No kidding. It's, yeah, they sprayed it with that, and they sprayed it with some funky smelling smoke. Um, I mean, because that thing is, I mean, it's nasty. Can you imagine being on that set with all that nasty smelling stuff that yeah. they put on all these creatures? But um, but, I mean, there there's a lot of things that that are you know praiseworthy from a I mean just a, a technical standpoint you know I mean I mean the char- there's a lot of character development which is which is like you like you were talking about you care about the characters um, they seem like uh, fellows who would be good to be around and then um, you also see a clear distinction between uh, good and evil now that's blurred later on but you see it between um, you know the the characters and then the the alien and then uh, the musical score I thought was outstanding as well they build suspense very very well. I mean, there's never at any point in the movie when you're thinking, well, this music don't fit here. Um, you know, if anything, it helps to set the tone for what, how you're supposed to feel um, while watching a specific scene. And, um, you know, this movie's over 35 years old. And, I mean, the, the special effects are still outstanding, as you've as you've pointed out. And, and the suspense, man, is, is similar to, like I was talking about with Predator, with you don't know who the monster is from one scene to the next. And because of that... You know, you don't, and especially after you see the arms get ripped off, you don't know what you don't know what to expect after that. I mean, anything's fair game. If the dude's stomach can open up and bite, have teeth, I mean, it's just um, it is. It's and a that, game changer, that, right? Like, it is, yeah. yeah. Well, so you the the cinematographer here is Dean Cundy, and he was begged by the special effects guy whose name is Botten, uh, Rob Botten, and I guess begging him, begging Cundy, Botten got hired on to do this, and he went on to have a stellar career. So he worked with Carpenter on The Fog and The Thing. He worked with Paul Verhoeven on RoboCop, Total Recall, and Basic Instinct, which two of those movies I'm much more comfortable recommending to you than that last one. And then um, he worked with Fincher on Seven and Fight Club. I, I don't think this guy could have had a better career as a as a special effects guy. That's incredible. Yeah, he ended up making um, he ended up making uh, a career that basically uh, earned him an, an Academy Award. So more power to him. It looks like he stopped working in 2002. But man, that guy that guy is incredible. Um, and you you mentioned music, so that's a hallmark of Carpenter, right? I mean, there's nothing more iconic in horror than the the Halloween theme music that he mm-hmm. just kind of wrote on his own. Have you have you watched Christine? Are you familiar? with that movie? I have, uh uh-huh. I watched that. I've probably watched that two or three times this year alone. I just really love that movie, and I think that's his best sound work. If, if, oh, wow. if you go back and watch it, if anybody listening to this wants to, go back and watch it and pay attention to what Jared just said. The music is such an asset, and it makes some scenes that would be otherwise ridiculous uh, super scary. So in, mm-hmm. in, in Christine, not to jump too hard, the first time the car is going to run down a, uh, you know, someone who attacked it, um, he has it playing this really... Um, um, inappropriate, basically, pop music from 1950 as it's snarling its way towards the person it's going to kill. Mm-hmm. Maybe the most iconic scene is another guy getting chased down by the car while it's on fire. And Carpenter's music takes that from like, uh, this is kind of weird. Maybe the guy should just run off the road and go find a path that a car can't drive on to mm-hmm. looming dread and destruction. And so, it, you know, if we're going to talk about all the ways that Carpenter is a master storyteller, we've got to talk about his musical ability because his movies are just not nearly as good if you strip it out or even give it a lesser musical uh, presentation it is mm-hmm. my take on that. Did, do you know he released an album pretty no, recently? I didn't know that. Yeah, he just released an album of his music from different movies and I've not picked it up but I think I'm probably going to try to because one... Oh, you'll I, have nightmares. <laughs> well, I, I will like the music. Yeah, I may have nightmares says the guy who used to, who weaned himself onto horror movies by falling asleep to him. Yeah. Um, but also, I just kind of want to like pay tribute and say, hey, you've earned a little money, a little bit of my money for being awesome with this, um, and and man, a totally underrated tool in the horror storyteller's use. Uh, I mean, music connects to humans in a way that I don't want to say is irrational, but that goes beyond just the rational. You're not thinking through how does this input affect me. Music kind of sneaks past all your defenses and gets into a different part of what it is to be human. And good on Carpenter. I don't know if he's intentional about that, if he's recognized that, but good on him for making use of that tool to kind of ramp up the scares Mm -hmm. oh yeah he's excellent at it you know the uh 
Do you want to talk about uh, some of the distorted, you know, the evil, false? That was going to be my next question. So, yeah, man, so tell me tell me where you think that this movie is, um, you know, we've talked about some things we think it's telling us the truth about. Uh, tell us, where is it telling us lies? Um, I think it, in its uh, negative view of humanity, basically, like you're talking about, I mean, there's there's fellas who, you know, there's one scene where, I can't remember the character's name, but he, he talks about his, he's known his friend for 10 years, and, you can just see that there's a love, um, you know, almost like a brothers um, among some of these guys. And then you bring in one alien and one question, you bring in paranoia, and all of a sudden these men act like they not only do they not know each other, but they hate each other. I mean, they're they're very suspect of each other to the point of, I mean, they're they're even willing to potentially kill innocent people if need be. I mean, you see that at the beginning with the Norwegian coming, where he's willing to kill, I, we assume, every man there. He's just opening fire um, in order to kill that thing. You know, and, and then these guys are, seem to be willing to do the same. I would say that the, the idol is um, selfishness in this movie, that the, that the emphasis at the end of the day, that the lie that is presented is that self-preservation is man's ultimate end yeah well said I, th- I think you're on there so jared just to clarify for people who are listening are you telling me that if you know we talked about earlier how this this film is made in our world and uh it's just the only difference is that an alien has visited our world sometime in the past so you think um if this scenario played out in the world in which we live, the events in that bunker are going to look a little bit differently. So what what do you think would be a more true representation of how this community would deal with this invader that can be any one of them? What do you, what do you think some of the differences would look like? So we, so we understand the contrast you're pointing to. Um, what it should look like, like it, like it, let's say a church group, you know, okay. this is a, this is a, this is a Christian group who's gathered together. Um, well, ideally, um, you wouldn't be willing to kill, innocent people in order to kill this alien or in order really these fellas it seems like they're about their own survival because um as far as they know the alien cannot escape and they do, i don't think they realize um that the alien could escape until they get down in under the snow and they find that spaceship um then that then i think they realize that it could and so that i believe they end up blowing that thing up yeah um but ideally, at the very least, you would seek to put others above yourself, um, that it wouldn't just be about my own survival, me, 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 me. Um, I mean, they, they, you know, you would need to, <laughs> it's interesting to try to put yourself in the movie, um, but you would need to come up with a test, a legitimate test, and have everybody take it, and everybody would need to be willing to do it, but um, you couldn't be willing to murder each other. I mean, that that should be... In other words, selfishness. It, it should there should be a selflessness. I mean, you know, as Christians, we've got to ask, you know, if we were in a similar situation, um, what would we do? Like, and and Christians have lived in similar situations like this. With when you think of like the bubonic plague, mm-hmm. and um, where entire communities were wiped out, and yet you have Christians who were in the midst of that, who would be caring for people, um, who would be helping the sick and helping the hurting, even even not even worrying about their own lives um you know there there are even christians today who are taking the gospel to um you know i think of uh you think of the famous um i think of jim elliott and the the famous five missionaries who were um killed by headhunters where they were willing to lose their lives i mean one of the fellows even had a gun and instead of shooting them he fired it in the air um yeah rather than defending yeah right yeah rather than um taking the life of those people i mean it's uh you know that's that's more it's (laughs) how do we go how do i go from john carpenter's the thing to jim elliott and the five missionaries killed (laughs) in in ecuador um but uh, but that i think that that is what it should look like i think that that is what our lord and savior would have would compel us to do like so the idol is selfishness in this movie and the counteraction of that would be selflessness yeah so you're saying take a cue from a guy who says i'll die on behalf of these people that you know are mine and that'll be the motif for the rest of your life together that that you give yourself for the for the rest of 
you know, the you give yourself on behalf of other people, basically, is, and that, the, is the yeah. cross-centered vision of life that Christianity is supposed to reflect, even though it often doesn't. Right, and that, I mean, and the story from that community is the fella who actually speared Jim Elliot, Jim Elliot's son, and that, that guy, Jim Elliot's wife, and um, I believe it was Nate Saint's wife, returned to the tribe afterward and shared the gospel with these men and women, and the tribe was converted. They were converted to Christianity. And the fella who killed Jim Elliot actually ended up traveling with Jim Elliot's son, sharing the gospel with others. I yeah. mean, it really is a, an amazing story. It, it actually they actually accomplished through their blood what um, well what Kurt Russell and these guys were trying to accomplish through taking life. You know, I mean, it's it's uh, it's uh, which you know they're they're it, the. The selflessness um, should be the goal, and that that's the example. Um, let me let me talk a little more about this. I think I think the the gospel, you know, the gospel answers answers the idol selfishness. One because first off, these guys are trying to escape evil. You know, they're 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 trying to leave this evil world. But what the movie reveals is that every one of these men have evil in their hearts. You know, they have a there is a selfishness. There is a self love that is greater than their love for any other human or anyone else for that matter. I mean, they're, they're willing to take innocent life if need be. Mm-hmm. And so even if they potentially escape this alien, they still haven't dealt with their evil heart. But the gospel answers that. And not only that, but there's there's an ultimate reality beyond man's survival. You know, some, something the movies don't tell us, you, you see it in Disney movies, right? And they lived happily ever after. Um, there is no ha- happily ever after. I mean, the, these these main characters in these movies, and and it would it would make a horrible movie if they just always showed people dying at the end, right? Yeah. Uh, but I mean, that's reality. That's reality. There is no. I mean, there's always another alien to fight, or there's always another evil that you got to deal with because we live in an evil world and even overcoming a temporary evil it just there's just another one that comes down the pike right after it you know and and you still have to deal with your wicked heart um you know in this movie it seems that the thing has won by the end um, but there there is a day coming when the evils of this world will be destroyed and god will balance the books you know we believe righteousness has a name uh, his name is jesus christ and he's going to reign for all eternity He's going to accomplish um, eradicating all evil. Um, and third, Jesus Christ has shown us how to love others as well. You know, he told us greater love is no man than this, than um, someone laid down his life for his friends. And uh, he was referring particularly to him laying down his life for his people. But I believe indeed that uh, we're the friends of Christ, and he's shown that love by giving himself up for us, not by taking our lives, but laying down his life that we might live. And that that's something you don't particularly see going on in this movie. You see the opposite. Yeah, yeah. Uh, so you've talked about Jim Elliot. You know, I think of, you know, we've got those historical records from the plague of Cyprian back in 250, 270, where these Roman officials who are no friends of the Christian movement are saying, you know, when, when plague comes to a city, it, the masses head out of the city and the only people going back in are Christians who are going in there to care for the sick and the dying, right? Mm, yeah. Um, now, I, I think you and I would both want to freely confess that there is too little of that in the modern church and probably the experience of a lot of non-Christians listening to this who um, have encountered Christians who aren't particularly loving in this way. But you're using the language of ought, that mm-hmm. this is how things should be and that there's a there's a, there's a a big narrative out there that a lot of people in history have subscribed to who that, that gives us a reason to say, yeah, yeah, it, it shouldn't only not be that we live only for self-interest, even if very often people make that choice. But we have credible resources and a, and a counter-narrative to live into in the story of Jesus of Nazareth. Amen. Yeah, amen. I mean, we, we claim to be his follower, and yet, um, I mean, if our Savior was willing to lay down his life um, to save us from his Father's wrath, from our wicked hearts, from this wicked world— then we need to follow his example. Now, we can't die for people's sins, but we can give our lives for the sake of them hearing and enjoying the grace that we enjoy in Christ. 
Um, yeah, so you're thinking not just of missionaries who take the gospel, but people who've gone and started, you know, orphanages and hospitals or, you know, I know that she's come under a lot of criticism, I think, unjustly, but someone like Mother Teresa who says, basically, I'm going to live among the most vulnerable, the most powerless, those who have no resources whatsoever. I'm just going to spend my days caring for them at the end of their days. Oh, yeah. I think that I think that is a, a mentality that we need to possess. You think of even, even like Lottie Moon and Annie Armstrong and the examples that we have um, of even Southern Baptists taking the gospel, um, seeking to take the gospel to people who've never heard and, and suffering um, so that these people wouldn't have to suffer eternally. I and mean, I, I think that that is the, you know, so the the idol is self-preservation. And I think you and I can probably both attest to our, I mean, it is tempting, isn't it, to, to constantly be focused on self, 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 self. And um, that is, it's an idol that's presented in this movie, and there is no remedy to it. Um, there's no remedy provided, but we we know that the that the remedy is uh, the remedy is the gospel. The remedy is Christ. Um, not only will he, not only has he shown us an example, but he literally those who repent and believe in him, he changes them. I mean, I'm I'm not the same man I once was because of Jesus Christ. Um, you know, he he puts in me a uh, not only a telos but an ultimate end where God's glory is the goal, but also a um, a strange desire to be selfless. You know, a, a strange. I say it's strange because it's contrary to the narrative that's all around us, right? Um, you know, there there's this constant emphasis on self. Me, me. I mean, even think about Christmas and and getting presents and and the consumerism and all the things that we're surrounded with this time of year. Um, you know, there there is a me emphasis, and and Christ actually compels us. Um, to do the opposite of that, where we prefer, where we're to prefer others above ourselves. Um, you know, Jesus um, put his Father's glory and his people above his own well-being. And uh, the good news is that because he's done that perfectly, you know, where I fall short, where you fall short, where our hearers fall short, if our trust is in Christ, then we're saved based on his perfect selflessness, not say based on our imperfect selflessness. So, so I, dude, I find myself too many times resonating with McCready, right? I, I find myself too many times thinking of my soul survival, where I'm so focused on self that I forget about others. Um, and I'm so thankful for, for Jesus, man, for, for what he's done for me, because I'm saved based on um, his selflessness, his finished work, and not my own. So when I fall short, I still have a Savior who who did these things perfectly for me, man. Well, yeah, I, I know McCready very well because McCready lives in my head and stares back at me from the mirror in that sense. Like, I'm the most selfish person I know, and I'm the one who's most interested in, you know, getting whatever it is I think is in my, my self-interest. And as a husband, a father, a friend, a pastor, all the roles I play in, McCready's always there in my own skull. So you're absolutely right. If, if I don't have a counter-narrative, if I don't have some kind of story that I believe actually compels me towards Toward ultimate reality and says that ultimate I mean, reality isn't just what's going on in your own mind and your own desires and your own hearts, but it's something outside of yourself that you need to conform to in a lot of ways. Yeah, I'm living just like in this bunker. I'm, I've got a gun pointed at everybody who I think could be possibly a threat to me, and they don't mm -hmm. get off the rope until they've verified that they're on my team. Mm -hmm. um, so when we're, you know, to go back to my earlier question, we're talking about the events of this bunker. You're not saying that something like this wouldn't play out or maybe wouldn't even play out much most of the time, but that this is not necessarily how it has to play out if people are um, looking to some other value system other than uh, self-interest. And specifically, as Christians, we're talking about this going, if, if anybody's going to play out a different story in these kind of circumstances, it needs to be the people who follow a guy that we believe laid his life down for people who were his enemies, right? Amen. Yes. Yes, absolutely. Yeah, I mean, I, I'm, not, I'm not pretending that if you stick me, you, and some of our buddies in a bunker and there's this alien life form that, that comes in and it's eating people's arms and it's walking around like a giant spider you know your head comes <laughs> off and it's walking around like a giant spider isn't I mean, that basically dude, what happens when we hang out i mean <laughs> yeah, those are my pretty members much. pretty much oh yeah nightmares um but but man i mean if you know i don't want to pretend like i'm going to be this super christian but uh, i can tell you i know the right answers of what i should do yeah and you um, can point to one guy in history at least one guy and say yes he did it right? he did it yeah. exactly right he did it. And, um, you know, I, I, 
he he lives in us, right? I mean, he lives in me, he lives in you through the power of the Holy Spirit, and and because of that reality, we are compelled um, to live like him. Yeah. Well, the the other thing I'm going to get at here is it's another one of these big questions. I think one of the reasons this movie endures and captures people's interest is that it really does raise uh, one of the major questions of life in a broken world, and it it raises the question of how much I can know the person standing across from me. You know, this has been a major philosophical issue all the way back to Descartes, right, who said, look, the only thing I can know is that I'm thinking, and I'm Mm -hmm. going to ground my experience of the world in the fact that I am thinking about the world, and that's really the most bedrock thing I can say about the world. And that's a, you know, there's a horror sci-fi version of that playing out with McCready, with Childs, with everybody here. Like you mentioned, the two guys who were like, we've been lifelong, or we've been buddies for more than a decade. They're asking that question, how much can I know about that person across from me? How much can I actually end up trusting them? And, you know, there's a lot of people listening to this who aren't Christians, don't care anything about the Christian faith. You know, they totally glassed out when we were talking about the gospel earlier. But we know those questions. Christian, non-Christian, you know what it's like to say, who is this person standing across from me? And I'll tell you, man, when I am, when my wife and I are having an argument, uh, when I'm having a hard time figuring out why my kid made a choice, when I'm looking at myself and going, you know, why do I act contrary to the things that I say are my highest value? I really connect with this story here in the thing where you're going, how much can another person be known? And uh, I don't really have good answers for that. I think that's maybe one of the best things this movie does for us if you want to look at something that invites further discussion it kind of gets you into that project of saying who is the other and how do i relate with them does that make any sense with you as you're watching this movie do you track with that i do i do because it seems like these fellas this ain't their first rodeo and some of them are so tight knit then all of a sudden their world is turned upside down in we assume in a matter of hours right i mean years go years almost go down the tube when they really start questioning but it's because of the it's because of the self-interest it's because of the self-love um you know and, and you know this movie really reveals that um it's the you know it's the the paranoia ensues um not primarily in my opinion because they don't know each other but primarily because they love themselves too much and and that is you know, and perhaps their friendships that they had were really superficial, were really, you know, I'm your friend because of how you benefit me. And once that benefit is gone, well, our friendship is gone instead of a selfless love, a selfless friendship, not not like Christ who lays down his life for his friends, right? Not this selfless love. It, you you literally, I mean, Jesus' disciples didn't benefit him, you know? Yeah. I mean, he, he's not needing something from them. But in this in this movie, it seems that there is this self, such a self-interest that even their friendships are, their, in my opinion, are superficial or, you know, you're my friend because you benefit me. The moment that benefit's gone, well, now you're my enemy. Yeah, that's a, that's actually a really de- personally depressing point you're making there because I'm thinking specifically of my relationship to my wife. When when I am being selfish, and I often am, um, you, you mentioned earlier how these guys became paranoid. I do that with a woman that I've lived with for 16 years and who I hold in the highest regard. You know, I, I start being selfish. It makes me paranoid that she's only operating in her own self-interest. I'm sitting there, you know, I'm willing to entertain suspicions. I'm not talking about, you know, moral failings or anything, but just her own motivations. You know, mm-hmm. I know her to be a deeply selfless person. I know her to be someone who gives herself to other people regularly and consistently. But as I'm being selfish, I'm assuming she's working basically the same way I am. Um, and, you know, like the Bible or hate the Bible uh, for our listeners, Proverbs 28 says that the wicked flees when no one pursues. And I think that that makes sense of the reality I've lived out, that, that when I'm leaning into the worst parts of who I am, um, I start becoming much more paranoid. I start becoming much more afraid of basically other people like myself. And I think this movie puts a lot of that in stark relief. Yeah, I mean, good call, man. There's a lot of insight there, but I, I do, I do think you're right that when we are, when we are inward focused, we start assuming that everyone else is committing that same inward focus. Now, the flip side of that, man, is is that if you if you not deal with our own selfishness, it's amazing how it changes. It literally transforms every single relationship in your life. 
You know, you you nip your own paranoia in the bud, your own selfishness in the bud through the saving gospel of Christ. And it literally, you know, when you are thinking rightly, um, and when I'm thinking rightly, when we're being selfless, it's amazing how being, you know, <laughs> the slavery comes when you're selfish. Like oh, that's absolutely like, true. I mean, like you're when, talking when I'm being, se- you know, to whatever degree I'm able to. Like I want to put all the caveats there, but when I am being more selfless than selfish, or you know, however you want to shake that out, it doesn't matter what other people's motivations are because I'm supposed to serve them regardless. Right? Exactly. It, right. it, it doesn't yes. matter if they're out, even to 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 do me harm. It, if I can actually tap into this motif of Christ giving His life, then it doesn't. I, I don't have anything to be afraid of other than my own wickedness returning. So it, mm-hmm. yeah. It's a transformative lens. I just wish I lived it out more. I wish I was able to. I wish I was able to be uh, that person more. And I look forward to living in a city with a king who's that way and whose influence more profoundly makes me that way. So, Amen, man. I mean, he'll finish what he started. Yeah. I, I'm the same way. I mean, you and I, and probably many of our listeners are the, are in the same boat where we are. You know, where where. <laughs> You know, if nothing is our is our fault, you know that like you're talking about, you're ta- you're basically taking responsibility for your selfishness. Well, in many cases, when we are being selfish, we're blaming everybody else. Like it, it's we're it's their fault for making me feel this way. It's it's uh, you make me so mad, so I lose my temper. It's your fault. Mm-hmm. It's not my fault. You know, all all these other people's faults for my really my pride and my sin, and my self selfishness. Um, but the the freedom is found like in once you you know the gospel it c- it can you know it, God's still working on us right so there's this slow transformation and um, this slow transformation into Christ likeness and once that uh, once that selfishness is nipped in the bud it it really um, like you were talking about it it uh, frees you to truly love people um, because you're not there's literally no self interest there's and like you were talking about if somebody's doing you harm. I mean, you're not you're not wor- you're not worried primarily about that because you're there to serve them. You're there to love them the way that First Corinthians thirteen tells us that we're to love others. Um, and so, something in this movie, man, there, there's no um, the only type of love in this movie, in my opinion, is self love. Yeah, I think you're right. I, in in that way, you know, maybe this is the way we put the bow on the discussion, but in the way that it puts self self love, uh, self interest, self centeredness, whatever you know, self dash word you want to stick on this as the overriding theme, it it pretty much tells us where that leads us. Right? Everybody's mm-hmm. alienated. Everybody's hostile towards one another. Uh, things are fragmented as they can be, and you're all just basically the ones of you who survive are sitting around waiting to die. And mm-hmm. you know, I, I don't mean to be grand. But in in a world that appears to be, it, it may not actually be, it may just be that we have better means of seeing it, but in a world that appears, at least in our country, to reflect a more fragmented society than um, we've ever seen. It, it's hard not to think, as someone who, who sees the Bible as a narrative that explains a lot about humanity and a lot about history and a lot about ultimate reality, it's hard not to see the one of the major roots of a fragmented society being everybody in business for themselves. And that's just just the mm-hmm. assumption of how we're going to live life around one another. Not live life together, but to live life around one another. I, you know, if if we're right, and of course we're speculating because nobody has that ultimate bird's eye view except for the Creator, but if we're right here... <laughs> This makes sense. Like the, the the narrative we're walking through here makes sense of what we see in the newspaper and on Twitter and on Reddit when we go get our news. Self interest leads to conflict and dissolution of society. Absolutely. And what's amazing is is that our society would not tell you that that's a horror story. Our society would tell you. At least Carpenter gets his genre right. <laughs> yeah. So our society would say it's a way to to enter into a comedy where you end in a, in a marriage or at least a romance. Right. That liberation is going to be found through self. it's more than self-expression, but like the pursuit of the most authentic version of you that's rooted in your desires at any given moment, that that, that's the path to liberty, you know, like live Mm -hmm. out your passions. And I don't, you know, there's, there's a lot about that that I want to say is good. I think God shapes us to have a particular set of interests and a particular set of abilities and, you Mm -hmm. know, whatnot, but it's got to be checked uh, in wicked people. Anyway, it's got to be checked by this idea that one of the highest callings of human life is to improve life for the people who are not me. Mm-hmm. 
absolutely right and not not to mention like you're talking about sin i mean you know our sin has has tainted our passions our sin has um almost like a, a fellow who needs glasses um and doesn't have them you know our, we can't see clearly without um without god correcting our vision without um you know the gospel without the saving good news of jesus christ without some sort of resurrection um due to the power of the holy spirit and um, I mean, we we need God to intervene, and as long as man is willing to go his own way, we will end up um, well, much like this movie in the end. I mean, you don't you don't want to we don't want to emphasize that, but I mean, you can. It doesn't take just turn on the news, you know. I mean, you can see how our society is so fragmented, and and when man does whatever is right in his own eyes, you end up with a totally fragmented society. Because and something else is it, it, it's a downward spiral. It doesn't stop. You know, it's like a snowball going down a hill and there's no bottom. Well, the only pushback I'm going to give you is that self-interest is a zero-sum game. It assumes that there is only enough resources for a few people to thrive. Mm. And I need to get as many of them as possible before somebody else does. So I'm you know, constantly in competition with someone else. Uh, and, mm. and I want to be clear, uh, again, I just have in mind that uh, you know, a lot of the people who listen to the show week to week, they're not Christians. We're not saying that Christians have the sole franchise on the idea that people People should live selflessly rather than selfishly. But what we're trying to say is, you know, if you take the the core narrative of the Bible, that Jesus Christ is the central figure of history, in Christianity we have a defining picture of someone who says ultimate reality gives itself for others. And that is how... Uh, you know, basically, life should be lived through that paradigm of saying I'm I'm most in step with the world as it is, even sometimes contrary to appearance, when I'm acting like the ultimate reality who gives itself for the benefit of other people. Mm-hmm. For the and I know, I know you you assume you assume this, but for the glory of God. Yeah, yeah, that, right. certainly, certainly. That, that this is the path where God is seen to be most glorious. Yeah, right. Yeah. Amen. Amen. I enjoyed talking this movie with you, brother. This uh, it is one of my favorites and one of my favorite. Uh, Carpenter films. Um, I think, uh, I, again, I think it's probably because of the, the frightening aspect of it, but it's genuinely, genuinely scary and it sticks with you. And again, there is often a, a clear good and a, a clear evil, but there's also some subtleties as well. But I, I and I see myself in many ways uh, negatively um, in this movie, but which which sends me running outside of the movie um, mm-hmm. to find yeah. to find a savior who is uh, faithful. Um, I mean, he is, you know, I, I could easily be one of the characters in these movie in this movie, and yet yeah, I um, often am one of those characters. Yeah. You know, like yeah, that's yeah. a lot of my experience. And because because Christ is a, a glorious savior, man, a, a gracious faithful savior um even though i am like them um you know in him i'm being made more not like them you know i mean yeah, it, it, it really it be, is amazing Lord. yeah let it be let it be to a greater degree hey last two things i got to say to you about the movie um our childs or mccready infected there at the very end one of them carrying the thing or been transformed into the thing i don't think so that's okay. my opinion I, I don't think so and have you seen the prequel that is also apparently some kind of remake from 2011? I have, and uh, I know it's gotten harsh critics, but I really I enjoyed it because part of it's because it is residual from this movie, right? Yeah, yeah, I totally get um, that. And they really told the story well. Like it or not, as compared to this movie, they told they tied them together amazingly, I thought. Okay, well, I'm going to go watch it then based on your recommendation. You were right to think this movie was awesome. I, I just had it in my head that I'd watched it and didn't, and um, I'll just follow your, I'll follow that path right down on that remake. I'll, I'll talk to you off air about what I think about the re- prequel remake thing. Jared, did we see something scary? I believe we did, brother. What do you think the scariest thing about this movie is? Dude, I think the scene where the monster bites the hands off and the head crawling around like a spider, I think that's it. Yeah, the the one for me was just when it starts freaking out in the dog kennel. I hate the thought of horrifying, dangerous things taking place where nobody sees them. And that that's the one that scared me. Like that one dog was, I don't think this would actually happen with a dog, but that one dog was like, peace out, and starts trying to bite his way through the wire mesh. Yeah. That's the dog yeah. I respect. Um, <laughs> I think people, if you like thinking about big picture issues, you know, if, if that's what you want out of a movie or a horror movie, I think this one sets a lot of those things right in front of you. And so I'm going to pull the Jesus Christ 
card on you. And I'm going to say the scariest thing we saw in this is what it looks like when unchecked self-interest beca- begins to dominate a community. Um, Good call. So there's a there's a danger, not just in the supernatural or the extraterrestrial, but there's a danger that lives in my own heart every day. You know, I'm the, I'm, I'm the thing is what this movie reminds me. And I've got to have something outside of me fix me because I don't have the resources internally to do it myself. Amen, buddy. Hey, Jared, before you go, where can people find you online? Uh, You can find me on Twitter at Jared H. Moore, and you can find me on um, Facebook at All Truth is God's Truth. I also have a podcast, All Truth is God's Truth. Check it out. Okay, you're on iTunes and all the major platforms, right? On iTunes, Google Play, Music, and Stitcher. Okay, good deal, man.